So thank you all for, for coming out. It's great, to, uh, it's great to be back and, and talking about fuel economy standards. So I'm going to go, uh, go through, tell you a bit about the history and future, hopefully, of what the US uh, is doing, and then something about the economics and efficiency of that and of different ways uh, that we have to save gasoline. So this first picture takes us back to 1955. This is a plot of how much gasoline it takes to drive 100 miles. Uh, okay, on the left-hand side, and if, if we're worried about gasoline consumption in the end, of course, the amount of gasoline that we use, given how far we drive, is really the relevant uh, measure. You'll notice that I put miles per gallon over here on the, on the right-hand side, which is more familiar, but this is all very nonlinear in miles per gallon. All right, so when we made the switch from 6 to 5 uh, gallons per 100 miles, that was going from 17 to 20 miles per gallon, that was just as important as the change from, say, 50 to 100 would be, or as the change from 33 to 50, right, in terms of fuel, uh, fuel saved. Okay, so you'll notice this peaked here, right, uh, right about 1970, uh, with the muscle cars and so on. Uh, incredibly dramatic declines here during the first two rounds of oil, uh, oil shock. Right about here, is where the fuel economy standards, 1978, the first fuel economy standards go into effect. And people think, uh, although it's, it's hard to show exactly what would have happened without the standards, but some of my own work and others suggest that this increase in fuel use here through the 80s and 90s would have been much more severe, much more pronounced, not perhaps up to this peak, but would have been much more pronounced without the, uh, without the fuel economy standards. Again, if I showed you a plot, uh, I should get it all on one graph, but if I showed you a plot of horsepower uh, of the car, it would do the, you know, sort of the opposite uh, of, of what's going on here with, with fuel use. Right now, here we are in uh, 2014 at 31.6 miles per gallon is the latest for model year 2014. That translates to about 25 miles per gallon on the sticker, which is meant to be a more realistic measure now. Okay, so 31.6 certified miles per gallon is about 25 miles per gallon running around in the, uh, in the fleet, and that's where we are now. Uh, and the green is where we hope to get by 2025. Okay. So the, th this change is uh, extremely ambitious. It's, it's on the order of sort of the second oil shock, or and probably even more ambitious than the first round of, uh, of fuel economy standards. And so if you wonder why I'm studying fuel economy standards, I, I would argue it's one of the most important policies that we're currently putting forward to try and save, uh, save gasoline in the US. Okay, so why, uh, why do we want to save gasoline? Well, an externality, for those not familiar, I'll try to minimize the economics jargon to, to the extent possible, but by an externality here, we simply mean damage that you do to someone or something else unintentionally by driving. Okay, or by consuming gasoline. So this is damage you do to the environment, uh, damage you do to other people's time if they have to wait uh, in traffic and so on. Uh, so the externality is related to gasoline use per mile, which is of course what we regulate with CAFE, uh, might center most heavily on things like climate change or notions of oil dependence and security, which are a little more, a little more vague, but these things relate most directly to gasoline use per mile. The other set of externalities that we worry about a lot with cars and people driving have to do with how far people drive. Okay? Uh, congestion being the most costly by, by many estimates. Accidents coming in just a little bit lower than congestion. Uh, and local air pollution used to be higher than these two put together and is now uh, much, much smaller, greatly, uh, greatly reduced by per mile limits on smog forming pollutants. How big are these? Uh, at $37 a ton CO2, which is what EPA is, is uh, using these days, uh, that amounts to about 33 cents per gallon. So for every gallon of gas you buy, you do 33 cents worth of damage to, uh, say, the environment or to, to the climate. Okay, and these ones down here are probably also in the order of 30 or 40 cents each, uh, with the total being somewhere a little over a dollar, maybe it would be a dollar 20. Uh, per gallon of gas uh, in terms of the external damage that you do when you buy it, right? You pay for the gas, that's an internal cost. You also do some external damage to the, uh, to the rest. Okay, so what happens with fuel economy standards? All right, well, fuel economy standards may, in the sort of dash lines here, we're not sure, uh, have unintended consequences for, for all of these, okay? So to the extent they might increase miles driven a little bit or maybe not reduce it very much, uh, if at all, you could increase congestion or accidents. To the extent they make vehicles smaller, 
which was a big sort of sticking point of the original CAFE standards and an even more important thing in the, the latest round of CAFE standards. We worry that accidents might get worse if people are driving smaller cars or lighter cars. Okay, and then local air pollution is going to be one that I'm going to talk about today, which hasn't been thought about very much. And this has to do with used cars. So fuel economy standards might make some of the oldest, dirtiest used cars stick around that extra year or two when they're 18 or 19 years old. And these are the cars that are responsible for, for the majority, in fact, of the local, uh, local air pollution. So those could be unintended consequences. We also have things we might call co-benefits, right? Things happening outside of CAFE. Accidents comes up again. This one can go either way. Okay, I'll say a bunch more about this today. Uh, how could accidents be improved? Well, it's known that there's a, fun, a fairly fundamental arms race uh, that goes on with vehicle size. Okay, I buy a bigger vehicle because you all have a bigger vehicle, which makes me buy an even bigger one, uh, and so on. Right? In order to protect ourselves from one another, we feel that we need larger, uh, larger vehicles. And if CAFE reduces that arms race, that could be a, a co-benefit, for example. Uh, and local air pollution, similarly, we're not sure, but smaller engines, lower horsepower might be, uh, uh, we might end up better off on, uh, on local air pollutants. Okay, so just quick, quick more background on what CAFE is. Stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy. Why? So it's because it's an average for each corporation or each manufacturer has to meet some target uh, miles per gallon uh, weighted by the quantity of vehicles sold uh, in the U.S. So how many small cars GM sells in Japan or China is irrelevant relative to the, uh, to the fuel economy standards. And similarly, even though Honda is based in Japan, Honda America, who sells the cars in the US, is regulated here and their fleet is, is held to, to some standard. OK, so from 1978 to 2012, uh, this was accomplished by uh, two separate targets. One, average miles per gallon for sedans. This is sort of standard passenger cars. And a separate target for things that we call light trucks, which are pickups, SUVs, and minivans, give or take. Okay. Um, and I'll say a bit more about what, what effect that has in, in a moment. The new standards going forward, there's a little bit of fuzziness here. So you, there was a couple of years where you could comply with either standard and, and be OK. But the new ones going forward now uh, separate targets based on the vehicle footprint. So instead of just separating SUVs from cars and giving them a different target to hit, you now get a different target to hit for every size of vehicle, effectively. The bigger the footprint, the weaker the target. Okay, so if you can make a vehicle that's really long or really wide, uh, the, the miles per gallon that goes into the average doesn't have to be very high. If you make a compact, it has to be really high. Okay, and this has a lot of implications, some of which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, one of the, the easiest to see uh, is that the three vehicle manufacturers with the largest footprints uh, are Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. And the three vehicle manufacturers with the smallest footprints are Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. And this, this automatically gives a weaker target, which is, translates to a, a, an easier to meet standard for whoever makes the vehicles with the bigger footprint, right? So that's one uh, potential reason for it. The reason that's stated in the rulemaking as to why they did this uh, is safety. And so I'm going to talk pretty much uh, more about safety later today. The argument was that if you do this, you remove the incentive for people to switch to a smaller footprint to hit their average, right? Because now if you switch to a smaller footprint, you just get a tighter target and you didn't help you any on the regulation, right? And so the, the, the notion here is that this prevents, this sort of shuts down that, that channel of switching, and instead everything is done through, uh, through technology. So fundamentally, these are mandates on an increase in, in fuel economy of vehicles. One thing I want to point out is that we're seeing these uh, crop up much faster than I, uh, or I think anyone really expected internationally. So the EU is now talking about strict fuel economy targets. China has them. Japan uh, just recently increased the stringency of their fuel economy rules. It, it used to be that a lot of these other places use the gasoline tax, which, which I'm going to tell you in a moment is, we think, far superior for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, but for whatever reason, fuel economy standards are taking off now uh, around the world. Even India, actually, is having uh, its first fuel economy standard going into, going into place. So this, is, this is just some of the uh, uh, promotional materials when the Obama administration passed this latest round of standards. To give you a sense of scale, uh, these are really big numbers. Okay? So the argument is that uh, due to this increase to 54, 
it's actually going to be 50 after you account for some loopholes. So my graphic there, a couple slides back, it went down to 50 rather than 54. Um, splitting hairs. Consumers will save $1.7 trillion uh, at the pump. Uh, and this statistic here, a bit smaller, but it's, it's one we'll come back to. So when you compare with a similar vehicle that you could buy today, the idea is that the vehicles in 2025 will cost about the same amount as they do today, but you'll save $8,000 in, uh, in gasoline, right, per, per, uh, per household. Um, so these are, these are all uh, very large numbers, big program. So the economics uh, of CAFE, the, the place to start, uh, I think, is to try and come up with, if you could come up with any way you wanted to save gasoline and try to find the least cost way to do it, uh, what would that be? Okay, and, and fundamentally that's going to combine many, many things. All right, so just a few of them, you could live closer to where you work, you could buy a smaller car, combine trips, carpool, bicycle, buy an electric car, buy a hybrid car. Uh, if we went around this room, we could probably come up with a hundred uh, very unique uh, ways to, to save gasoline, okay? And economically, the cheapest way to save gasoline is going to be to do a little bit of all of those uh, hundred things that we come up with. Because there's usually, so let's suppose I came up with one that was uh, reduce the horsepower of the car you buy, okay? There might be somebody uh, who is just on the fence between buying the high horsepower and the low horsepower car. Getting them to switch is, is very cheap. We should do that. If we try to do too much of that, though, you might be cutting into people who really, really value the acceleration of their car, and this is very costly. The same thing would be true for carpooling. Okay, there might be somebody who's very easy to carpool for, and we should take advantage of that to save gasoline. Um, but there are other people who are just very costly and very inconvenient to try and, try and carpool. So the question then economically is, well, what combination of these many hundreds of things is the cheapest one? Which one should we do the most of? And so the gasoline tax, and the reason why it, you'll see it sort of championed by economists, and I'm, I'm really no, uh, no different, is because it lets the market, or I suppose more precisely, the, the individuals buying cars and deciding where to drive and where to buy their house and, and uh, uh, so on, uh, it lets the market choose which of this incredible array of things to do uh, that's, that's going to be cheapest or that it, uh, it wants to do to avoid, the, avoid paying the gasoline tax. Right, so fuel economy standards, uh, in contrast, use this very small subset of the strategies. Okay, so they do encourage switching to hybrids, for example. They do encourage electric cars. They used to encourage smaller cars. They don't anymore. So we've ruled out uh, that channel. Right? They don't encourage any of this other stuff, right, particularly. And we have lots of policies. Right? We have separate programs. California, we have an a assembly bill that, that, that encourages uh, development, mixed-use development and so on to get people to live closer to it. So we try putting policies on all these things, but it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to get that mix just right. Okay? And the, the economics of it is that a gasoline tax maybe helps you find or helps people, uh, uh, gives people the flexibility to find that, uh, that mix. Okay, in any case, what does CAFE uh, in particular do? So a few of the, the important strategies used uh, under CAFE, well, I'll broadly call one technology. So this is better aerodynamics, uh, hybridization, electrics, and so on. Uh, lighter weight is another very important one for the current round of CAFE standards, and lower horsepower. So those, those three are basically those are all good ways to save gasoline, nothing against them, but those are the three ways that we're going to be pushing really hard on uh, going forward, and we're not going to be pushing very hard on, on a bunch of other ways. This is the 2015 F-150. Uh, these are uh, only the aluminum parts. Okay? So, so this truck now is made almost entirely. All the body panels and most of the frame is made of aluminum. It's uh, 750 pounds lighter uh, than the old F-150. Okay? It also uh, is down from, uh, uh, the base model is down from 300 and some horsepower, 305 to 280, 270, 280. It took about a 10% horsepower reduction, uh, 750 pounds of weight off uh, in the aluminum, so it accelerates maybe a little better even than the old one because they took so much weight off, but it's not going to tow quite as well, the engine doesn't have as big displacement, uh, and so on, right? So there's, there's, these are the sorts of trade-offs that are getting made to meet the new uh, the new standards. Okay, what does CAFE miss? So at the risk of, of uh, 
hitting this point too hard, traffic, right? So it misses fewer miles driven. Some economists have argued that driving fewer miles is perhaps one of the cheapest and most important ways to save gas, and yet fuel economy standards don't, uh, don't push on that margin. Uh, it misses smaller and fewer vehicles, so just getting people out of their vehicles and into public transit or something is not particularly encouraged by CAFE. Uh, and, and this is one that's, that's true of the, both the old and the new standards, but particularly the old standards. Uh, rather than encouraging a lower fraction of pickups and SUVs, which is, again, a way to save gas and probably one that we should be, we should be doing, at least in part, uh, the, the old CAFE standards actually encouraged more pickups than SUVs by the way that they were, uh, by the way that they were written. Right? So, so what you see here is there's a, a very large picture of, of things that can be done. CAFE pushes on a, a small piece of that, uh, that picture. Okay, so what do we get? Uh, there have been a number of papers just trying to compare fuel economy standards to gasoline taxes, looking at cost. I've worked... Uh, some in this, in this literature, comes out about three to five times more expensive than a gasoline tax per gallon of gasoline that you actually, uh, that you actually save. Okay. Uh, the, the two main reasons, at least in my own work, were this missing incentive on miles and the missing incentive to switch away from, uh, to switch away from SUVs. Okay, there's, there's many more uh, sort of subtleties to this, in particular the old standards didn't put much of an incentive on Honda and Toyota at all. So Honda and Toyota could sell bigger luxury vehicles, while GM and Ford had to cut back on the numbers they sold. Uh, Toyota called these Lexus, Honda called them Acura, right? And, and these, uh, these sorts of switches are things that cause some of the savings from, uh, from CAFE to leak away. Okay, I can say, even not having studied this, I, I think I can say, and people should study this, that the new footprint-based standards are unambiguously even more costly than the old Cafe. So why do I think it's safe to say this? Well, they're very similar to the old cafe, but the thing that they make different is they, they just take one of the channels away, right? So, so we can no longer switch to smaller vehicles to meet the, to meet the regulation, right? So, so one of the potential ways, to, and, and, and I'll talk about safety in a moment, so there, there is perhaps a trade-off here, but at least just in the sphere of cost of, of sort of shifting people's decisions around, we've taken away one more, uh, one more potential channel. And so the gains have to come mostly from technology, weight, and power uh, in, the, in the new cafe. All right, so there, there are a few other pieces then uh, to this that look beyond the new car market. So everything I've talked about about these costs have to do with, uh, with sort of cars and driving. Uh, but there are, of course, very important effects of fuel economy rules outside the new car market uh, that we may want to take, uh, uh, sort of take, some, uh, take some stock of. So the first, and this is in fact a paper that's not quite done yet, but I'm working on right now, and I'd love to talk with you more about it at some point, uh, is this increased retention of low fuel economy vehicles in the used market. Okay, if you own, so, so uh, one of the executives at Ford, uh, who I was talking to a few weeks ago, owns the last steel F-150. Uh, the, where they came off the, the assembly line, okay? Now, if you, so you don't own the last one, but if you own one of the last steel F-150s, uh, its value on the used market might go up a little bit uh, just because of its different handling characteristics, higher horsepower, say, than the, uh, uh, than the new one. And furthermore, it's going to have been, when you purchased it, it will be much cheaper than the 2015 one because it doesn't have all that aluminum and so on in it. All right, so the thing with CAFE standards is the bigger and heavier the vehicle, uh, for the new standards, the more cost is going to have to be increased uh, for, those, for those vehicles. And implicitly, the car makers are also maybe tax those a little bit in the sense that they can't sell too many of them or they risk going over the standard. They might want to sell a few more of the cars with lower horsepower, lighter weight, so they might implicitly subsidize those a little bit. And so what's going to happen is that it's, it's going to be easier and, and cheaper to replace the small ones and harder and more costly to replace the big ones, and so you keep these, these heavier, bigger cars around longer. Okay? I'll go into a bit more detail on that. So that's one, one piece about the used market. And it, the used market in general, I think, is, is understudied given that it's, you know, cars more than one year old are 95 some percent of all the cars out there. So even small changes in, in the way the used market evolves can be very, very important. Uh, and the second, the second piece outside CAFE that that I think at least is potentially very important is changes in safety uh, of the fleet as it changes perhaps due to incentives from CAFE. There's the third one, uh, and that has to do with attribute changes. So another potential 
uh, effect of CAFE is that it doesn't just change fuel economy in which vehicles are sold, uh, it might change the actual attributes of the car. So you might get more SUVs like in the 1990s. Now perhaps with the long wheelbase, not sure, because the longer you can stretch the wheelbase or make it wider, uh, the, the weaker the fuel economy target. Right? So this is from uh, uh, January's uh, uh, American Auto Show uh, in Detroit, the all new Range Rover with long wheelbase. Okay? Uh, and so they added six or eight square feet under this thing, which moved the fuel economy dar target down by, by several miles per gallon. Right? Extended cab pickup trucks have a target that's, that's three or four miles per gallon weaker than regular cab pickup trucks. Okay? So to the extent uh, that you worry, now the automakers have sworn up and down that it's very, very hard to change vehicle width uh, or wheelbase and that, that we won't be seeing these sorts of, of changes. It's, it's, it's unclear. An, an economist would be suspicious of that, uh, that claim, perhaps. Okay, so, so how to categorize these effects in used markets? Another piece of jargon here, uh, which will be leakage. So how do we define leakage? Well, leakage is just uh, if you increase fuel economy one place, but it worsens someplace else, we'll say that some of the increase you thought you were getting has, has leaked away. Right? Uh, and so for, for the new and used car market, you get these improvements to cars that are new, and CAFE only applies to new cars. Some of those improvements might leak away if you see things happen like the, the most gas using new cars stick around for the longest, uh, if the small ones start to get scrapped more quickly. And so, so in this paper, we set out to ask, well, how big is this effect really? Right? So maybe scrappage is just so determined almost, almost exogenously, just runs along at some, some normal rate, that this effect is actually tiny, or maybe it's bigger. So we set out to, to measure this. Um, my co-author and I did not count these, but uh, we have data uh, on all registrations in the U.S. Uh, at the sub-model level. So this is, you know, two-door versus four doors, automatic versus standard transmission, the different engine sizes. Because we have a really good idea of how many cars are registered. Um, so this would be like a 95 Toyota Corolla, the LX model with particular transmission, right? And so, and we see how many of those are registered in 2005. Then when we go to 2006, we can see how many of them disappeared, and that's going to be the that's going to be the scrappage, right? And so we match this to things like uh, characteristics and fuel economy, and most importantly, the used car prices. So if the price of those 95 Corollas were to go up for some reason, uh, we might see them get scrapped more slowly. If the price of the 95 Corollas were to go down because people are worried about the brakes or the, or was it the accelerator uh, that's stuck, right? Then, then we might see more of them get scrapped, right? And so the, the price of the vehicle uh, is going to be related to scrappage, and that uh, the, the elasticity or the, the rap rapidity with which that relationship moves uh, is going to determine how big these effects are of, in, the used, uh, in the used market. So I just have a couple quick pictures of, of scrappage to show you, uh, show you our data. Um, this is the average scrap rate per year, so 0.05 is 5% uh, by make. Uh, any of you who own a Hyundai uh, will be interested to know perhaps that they are scrapped at two to three times the rate uh, of other vehicles. This is not necessarily because they break down, it's because they're very, very easy to total in an accident. And of course, as we all know, there are a frightening number of accidents uh, in this country. And the, the repair cost uh, on a Hyundai is, is very easily more than the cost for the insurance company to just cut you a check or replace it uh, with a similar one in the used market. Okay, and then the reverse is true uh, down here, the BMW, I believe, is at the, uh, at the bottom. Okay, and among new cars, most of this scrappage, it's about 1.5% to 2% per year. Uh, that's just the number of cars that get totaled uh, in accidents. Uh, and then later on, of course, there's lots of other things that happen, like mechanical failures, you know, is it worth replacing the transmission, uh, and so on. Right? So this, this is determining the scrappage. Here's a bit more of what we're going to uh, care about. So the high mile per gallon cars, the gold line here is the top quartile of cars. All the compacts and the Priuses and so on are in this top quartile. You can see they're scrapped at almost twice the rate of the SUVs and pickups in the baseline. And our question is going to be, when you have a fuel economy standard, it's going to push these apart a little bit more. Right? So the high mile per gallon cars might get scrapped even a little bit faster to the extent they're cheaper to replace uh, when they're new because the manufacturers are implicitly subsidizing them. The low mile per gallon cars are going to get scrapped even a little bit more slowly 
because people are keeping them around because of their higher horsepower or they're very expensive to buy, uh, to buy new, very expensive or impossible to buy, uh, to buy new. And we want to ask how much, uh, how much that spreads apart. Uh, this is often attributed to, to Howard Gruenspeck, who, who thought about this effect uh, back in the 80s. Uh, and we wanted to set out uh, the high time, we think, to set out uh, to measure it. So scrap, so there's sort of two pieces here. Scrap, this is the one I've really been focusing on. Scrap rates for high mile per gallon cars get larger and low mile per gallons get smaller. There's also another interesting effect, which is that all vehicles will become uh, longer lived as a result of CAFE. And that's simply because you're shifting a greater portion of the cost of driving into the upfront cost. I take the extreme where I have an infinite fuel economy vehicle. Right, so now I have no operating cost, but a much more expensive upfront cost. Well, it's going to be worth it to keep that much more valuable piece of capital around longer than if I had a cheap piece of capital, but I was paying a lot every year for, for gas. Right? So what this means is that other sorts of things, other sorts of exogenous technological improvement just takes longer to work its way through the fleet uh, once you have longer lived vehicles. Okay, so this is our, our, our picture of trying to see how big this, uh, this effect is. We've, we have, there's, there's a lot of modeling that goes into this, but here's the, uh, the, the black line is how much gasoline you might hope to save with a CAFE standard uh, if the scrappage just went along as it always has exogenously. Okay, and you'll notice that you don't save much at the beginning. That's natural because CAFE standards only apply to new cars, right? So it takes uh, a while here, 15 years or so, before it works its way through the fleet. Um, the red line is how much you save if we allow the scrappage rates of used cars to adjust as the values of the cars adjust. So if car value goes up, they get scrapped a little bit more slowly uh, as we've measured it uh, uh, and vice versa. Okay, and so this amounts to about something on the order of 15% of the savings that you think you'll get in, in uh, gasoline actually leak away uh, in the sense that the used market starts to look a bit different uh, uh, than it had. Okay, so that's my piece on uh, sort of connected but not directly regulated markets uh, for the use side. The other thing that I've worked on recently uh, is cafe and safety. And I think that this is an incredibly controversial uh, subject uh, in, in, in many ways. So there's lots of arguments on both sides. But when you boil it down, there's a long engineering literature and some economics literature on this. There's basically two opposing effects of fuel economy standards on safety. Okay, the first uh, is the one that, that uh, is often championed by opponents of CAFE, which is that large vehicles seem to offer more protection to their occupants than small vehicles. Uh, and this is, of course, particularly true in things like single car accidents, which are more than half of all serious uh, accidents in the US. The other effect is that we've been living with an arms race uh, in vehicle choice. And CAFE standards might mitigate this arms race by sort of pushing everybody back down toward saner, in some sense, sizes and weights of, uh, of cars. Right, so how do we measure this? Of course, you can just go out and look and see how many accidents with injuries or fatal accidents occur in different types of cars. Uh, but there's a major problem with, with estimating that, which is selection. So who it is that buys pickup trucks and who it is that buys minivans are incredibly different slice of the population. So pickup truck buyers live in uh, less dense areas, which have very hazardous roads, by and large. Uh, different ages, educations. Uh, we know that alcohol is a factor in some 30 or 40 percent of fatal accidents. Right? So all of these uh, effects uh, are going to be highly correlated with what kind of car you buy. And so if I just go out and look and see how many minivans got in really bad accidents, I'll say, well, a minivan is an incredibly safe big vehicle. Right? But that could just be because of who's, uh, who's buying it. Right? So the, uh, the, the main piece of, of the research was really trying to figure out how to, how to get around that selection problem and, and learn something about how dangerous vehicles are when they collide with other vehicles in the fleet uh, uh, separately from, from that. Okay, so I've, there's going to be a lot of words on this, uh, this slide. I apologize. We're going to try to summarize it all in one, all in one table. Okay, for the uh, the safety results and actually some of the others. So the first piece is this efficiency in car markets, and that's how good the policy is at getting at all these cheap ways to to save gasoline. The gasoline tax we argued is the most efficient because it finds naturally all the many things people can do. A single fuel economy standard, what do I mean by this? Well, that's just one single average for the economy. 
People can meet it however they like. They can do smaller cars, they can do fewer SUVs, uh, uh, and so on. So this is the simplest fuel economy standard you could imagine. So it's not as good as the gasoline tax, but it still does pretty general things to the, uh, to the car market. It has lots of flexibility. Uh, the original CAFE standard shut down some of that flexibility by, by p pulling pickups and SUVs out and saying that those, that's sort of a separate category. And then the new one uh, goes even farther and pulls vehicles of all different footprints out. Okay? And so you just get more and more costly as you pull out uh, um, channels through which uh, the gas can be saved. So what do we know uh, about accident fatalities in particular? So the data is best on, on fatal accidents, which is where I, I focus the study. Um, it turns out that a gasoline tax has roughly neutral effect on, on accident rates per, uh, per car or per mile. So a gasoline tax encourages people to buy somewhat smaller cars, but that's a pretty uniform shift. Not much happens uh, there, but of course there are big benefits in accidents through a reduction in miles driven. Right? So just a mechanical, or if there are going to be fewer accidents when people are driving less. The single fuel economy standard, those two effects I talked to you about. So one, one is that cars get smaller when you have a single fuel economy standard. So single car accidents uh, and even two car accidents between two small cars are a little more dangerous than two accidents between two bigger cars where people sit farther back from the, the front of the car, say. Um, those two effects on risk uh, and the other being the reduction of the arms race cancel each other out. So, right, so imagine what's happening here is that cars are getting a little smaller, so there's a little more risk from that. But we're taking a lot of the very biggest SUVs and pickups off the road. Uh, and so reducing that arms race effect, they compete. And it so happens that they, they almost exactly cancel. So you get a neutral effect on safety with a single fuel economy standard. Uh, the bad news was for the original CAFE standard. So here what we had was separate bins for cars and the pickups and SUVs. We made vehicles smaller within each of those bins, because that was still a legitimate way to, to meet the CAFE standard. But the numbers of vehicles in the bins stayed about the same. And so the average sort of bad accident between a small car and a pickup had just as much weight difference or size difference as before, because uh, we had these two separate bins. We made cars smaller within each bin, but then the, the distance between the bins didn't change much. And so unfortunately there, you don't really reduce the arms race effect, but you do end up with smaller cars, which are a bit more dangerous in, uh, in single car accidents. What about the new footprint-based cafe? Well, here this is actually pretty trivial to look at because the new standards intentionally lock us into the current fleet looking almost exactly as it, as it is. They keep the classes and the sizes of vehicles, at least in, in footprint terms, almost exactly the same by design. Right? They want, they want um, things like technology, uh, hybrid engines, electric drivetrains, and so on, to be driving this and not any sort of switching in the fleet. And so these are also neutral uh, on safety. So in that sense, they accomplished their goal. Uh, but the question will be, was it uh, you know, sort of they drove us to a, a less efficient standard because it's pushing really, really hard on technology and not allowing some other, uh, other ways of saving gas. So, so there's, there's more questions to be asked, but this was the, uh, this was, this was the piece I had on, on safety. Okay, the last, uh, the last part is, I'm not going to flip back through, but if you remember that $8,200 that each family was going to save in 2025 as a result of the, the new fuel economy standards, uh, this has to do with, with energy efficiency and what we sometimes call an energy efficiency paradox. Uh, the notion being that, that if people are not choosing the vehicles that are best for them, in some sense, a uh, fuel economy standard could help people choose uh, better cars, and indeed you get what the claims are uh, from EPA of gasoline savings exceeding the technology costs and, and exceeding it by, by quite a bit. Okay, so I, I haven't done the calculation myself, but a, a good friend um, who's, who's uh, at MIT now did this and argued that if you look at EPA's justification for CAFE, about 80 to 90 percent of that justification is people will save money on gas. And 10 to 20% of that justification is this will be better for climate uh, and pollution and, and uh, sort of national security, right? That, and then he, he went so far as to call EPA a consumer protection agency. Uh, I'm not sure I'll, uh, I'll, t I'll take that step. But that's, there, there is this sense that, that very much of the benefits of CAFE might come from helping people make better, uh, better car choices. Okay, so this has been the subject of several, uh, several recent studies. And uh, used cars are a very interesting place to look. And of course, uh, we just gathered a bunch of data on used cars, so we also, uh, also looked there. I'll put it in 
uh, a giant picture, which I'll try to explain here. So uh, the dots are just different models of vehicle. I've labeled a few of them. So here's the Ford Taurus and the Chevy S10, Toyota Tundra, and so on. So the dots are just a model of car. What we're going to do is increase the price of gas by a dollar. Okay, and this, of course, happens naturally over time, uh, and see how the prices of these vehicles move. Okay, so you'll notice that, that there's a general slope here, which should, should make sense. So vehicles with a high fuel economy gain value. These are logs. So this is a uh, Toyota Corolla uh, gains about 10%. Uh, used Toyota Corolla gains about 10% when gas goes up by a dollar. A used uh, Ford Explorer loses about 10% when gas goes up uh, by a dollar. The other thing to notice, though, is there's things here like the Ford Ranger, which is not terribly efficient. It gains in value, whereas the Intrepid, which is more efficient, but it loses in value. Okay, and the reason for this has to do with substitution. Okay, so the Ranger is a substitute for, say, the Tundra or the F-150, which is one of these big circles uh, down here. So the point is when gas goes up, people move from their, their full-size pickups into their compact pickups. So you see these price changes, people move from small cars that don't get very good fuel economy to somewhat smaller, maybe about the same size cars that get better fuel economy. Right? So you have all these, all these and, and the, the thing we liked about doing the estimation this way was that we can be completely flexible on what that substitution is. We don't have to say which vehicle is a substitute for which. It's all aggregated up into the price change on that vehicle when, uh, when the price of gas goes, uh, goes up. And incidentally, this is the sort of variation that we use to identify the effects on scrappage. So in one year, the price of gas changes and makes some cars more valuable and some cars less valuable. Uh, everything else is the same because it was the same period of time that changed. And we can see the scrappage change differentially for those different, uh, different vehicles. Okay, so how do we translate this into, you know, is CAFE saving us money? Uh, so, so here you can just look at, it's, it's, one number in particular, I've taken those, all those 10 percentages and, and so on, uh, aggregated them all up. Quartile 4 here is the most efficient quartile of used vehicles on the market. And here's for uh, all ages, uh, average together. This is $1,400 increase in the price of the most efficient vehicles relative to the least efficient when gas goes up. Okay, now other things could have changed. There could have been a recession or a boom or whatever, so all vehicle prices can be moving up and down. This is just the, the change between the most and least efficient uh, vehicles. And you'll notice that among pretty new used cars, it's really pretty big. I mean, you could, you could buy a, a, a used uh, or buy a new uh, pickup truck, say, drive it off the lot, you lose a few thousand dollars doing that. The price of gas could change next week. Uh, Saudi Arabia lets up on the, on the production a little bit, uh, and you could lose another $2,000 on, uh, on the value of that, uh, that pickup. So these, these prices, price changes are quite, uh, quite big. And in fact, uh, what some other authors have done is to take these price changes and think about how much money you're going to spend on gas during all the, the time the car has left. So for a two to five year old car, this is maybe 10 years or 15 years. For a 10 or 15 year old car, this is only four or five years. Add up the gas you're going to spend in the years it has left and see if it looks like, like these numbers. And in fact, it looks almost exactly like them. Okay, so what this is saying is that the used car market is rationalizing 100% of the change in the price of gas. So when the price of gas goes up a little bit, uh, these, these prices swing the next day uh, in the used market. The dealers have these automated systems now to change the price of uh, vehicles as they swing at, at auction. Um, which suggests that, that at, least in the, uh, at least in the used market, uh, fuel savings uh, seem to be capitalized in the sense that consumers are paying attention to them. So that's an argument, I would say, against trying to use CAFE to help people make better choices in the sense that it looks like people are already thinking about the price of gas when they buy a car, at least when they buy a used car. So we don't have as good evidence uh, in the new market. I think more might be, might be interesting to find. Um, it's more difficult to study. There's lots going on. So you could have car makers, say, ramping up horsepower due to some sort of uh, competition uh, factor, trying to gain market share. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, for new car makers. So they might not want to put a new technology in that saves fuel because they're uncertain how it'll work out with maintenance or if it'll sell. 
problems of actors within the firm. But I think what we can learn from looking at the used market is that at least on the consumer side, there seems to be pretty much attention being paid to, uh, to gasoline price. Uh, so just to, to go quickly back over uh, those, those points. So CAFE misses a number of margins for saving gasoline, which makes it less efficient. We might still like it for lots of other reasons. It still it does its job at reducing gasoline use, uh, but it's, it's much more costly than something like a gas tax. Uh, there are some further reductions in efficiency, which, which we've just uh, sort of worked out here due to incomplete regulation in the used car market. Uh, safety effects depend on the rules, but sim simple cafe and gasoline taxes seem to be the best on, uh, on safety. And at least used car prices suggest drivers do indeed consider fuel costs when they, uh, when they shop, for, shop for a car. And I've got to start, start the discussion off. I don't know how useful these will be, but just a few, uh, few policy questions. So if, if we're thinking about going forward with CAFE, are there complementary policies uh, that we would want to use to maybe get at things like congestion? Right? So a gas tax obviously reduces congestion. Uh, fuel economy standard doesn't. It might even make it worse uh, if people drive more when their cars are cheaper to, to operate. Um, how can we incentivize all efficient cars and not just new ones, right? So this could fix the problem in the used market. This thing is very important. Uh, even very small rebates or fees on registrations. So if you, if you charge uh, used uh, people with 10-year-old pickups $50 on their registration and give a $50 discount to somebody with a 10-year-old compact car, you can save a surprising number of compacts from the scrap heap and send a fair number of the F-150s to the scrap heap. This, this, this market seems to be, this, this margin seems to be fairly, uh, fairly elastic and that would be very important for local pollution. Uh, and then this last one is just sort of, is there, is, do we really think it's possible to reduce miles without raising the price of fuel? Right? So you can do lots of things, trying to encourage people to carpool and move closer to work and stuff, but if there's always that temptation of the cheap gas out there, do we, how far do we think we can really get without, uh, without raising the price of fuel? Uh, okay, so thanks. Okay. Right, right on time, Mark. Way to go. Okay, so why don't we open up for questions? Yeah. Um, I if there is any comparison between the um, people that all the car on the road another year versus the emissions from manufacturing and delivering mm -hmm. a new car. Yeah, this is interesting. So life cycle emissions, as it's often called, uh, or well, well to wheel, sometimes you'll hear, uh, they can be a big piece uh, of, of cars, and this is something that you actually will save uh, a bit of in the used car, uh, sort of the logic of the used cars here, right? That if you make cars more expensive, people will do more to repair them and so on. Keep them around longer, you won't have to recycle the steel back through to make another, uh, another two, new car quite as soon. And I, I have to say, I don't, I don't work on life cycle stuff. I know some people think it's, it's a large piece, but I'm, yes, I'm abstracting from that here. So this is uh, it's about fuel use. Yes. Oh, okay, I have a question about the uh, different price uh, pressures to different companies. So, uh, in, 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 in the previous policy, in the yeah. previous uh, cafe uh, version, it required the average fuel efficiency of the whole company. Yes, just not, company by company. Yeah, and the, at that, at that uh, situation, the, the pressure to different companies uh, is different in one way. And the, once the new version in, in implemented in uh, 2013, mm -hmm. it's uh, attribute based. It's right. based on the footprint, and the, it may be in favor uh, in favor to the the, the the domestic cars or or the car companies mm -hmm. who have more uh, larger uh, car products, right? That's right. So, are there any uh, effects already ex uh, uh, revealed in the current data? From the, the, the price w uh, pro uh, from the policy switch. Uh, so I have not I have not convinced myself that I can see it yet. So I feel like you're seeing a bit more long wheelbases uh, and so on. Uh, and I feel like the the Toyota and Honda have both released very efficient compact cars. Uh, and under the old standards, they were completely unconstrained. I mean, their average was several miles per gallon above the target. They there was nothing you know they didn't have any need to. 
uh, to meet this, and they've, there have been some aggressive changes in the last couple of years. The, uh, the new Honda Fit is, is, is uh, incredibly efficient, for example, coming out in 2016, I believe. Uh, so I think that I think that we'll see it very soon here. Not quite yet, but but very the soon. Share and yeah. rent doesn't change a lot according to the data. The so perhaps some of what the the Japanese makers gained during the old cafe standard they might now uh, give back. Yeah, it's hard to uh, uh, hard to get a handle on that. I can uh, yeah yeah. But there, there are. Yes, I mean, cer certainly the, uh, you could argue even the hope of the policy is that Ford and GM will see their fortunes, uh, fortunes rise as a result of, of this. Uh, uh, Charlie? Uh, you, may not, you may not be able to uh, answer this, but uh, you mentioned that a lot of different countries are adopting cafe standards yeah. now. Are you aware of any innovative uh, and different approaches being taken uh, elsewhere in the world? Uh, I will say that almost everywhere else, they are attribute based. So the US was actually one of the last to get on the attribute, uh, attribute basing uh, system. In Japan, they're based on weight. And there's been a lot of concern of just using heavier steel structures to, to move up to the next, uh, next, next weight bin. And there's some evidence of that now in a new paper. Uh, the, the European ones are based on engine displacements, uh, which might, it, it's, um, so when you do that, you know, you almost shut down another channel, right? If you're using engine displacement now, if I just reduce horsepower, uh, say, or reduce the weight and put a smaller engine in the car, again, I haven't gained anything on CAFE because now I have a tighter standard to meet because it's a smaller engine, right? So in some sense, our footprint basis is more flexible than something like pure displacement uh, base. But I haven't seen anything that, that uh, sort of goes the other direction in terms of innovating by, by allowing more flexibility. It, it, they seem to be quite rigid in, in many places. Yeah. Lynn, why don't you go? So your, your um, analysis seems to suggest that, that car buyers are actually rationally considering um, uh, gas mileage and, and, uh, and cost of buying fuel in the process. But there's hardly any mention in ads for car companies of, uh, of those things. Instead, mm -hmm. they endlessly try to sell cars based on some version of coolness factors. That's right, the color uh, and the so, power. So how he is said it? New, he said used cars. <laughs> I said used cars, yes. Yeah. So that, that, may be a, that may be an important difference, right? So you don't think about horsepower as the first thing when you buy a used car. You might not even know it. Yeah, yeah that's uh -huh. right. So, so, the, so, so my question is, how do, how do uh, consumers that actually appear to be thinking about this stuff, how do they actually know what to do, given the fact that there's no, there's no sticker, mileage sticker on a That's used right. car yep. when you buy it, right? So, That's right. so how, the, it seems like there's a disconnect in, uh, in how people do this. Uh, you, would, you would be surprised. So, so there's obviously mistakes, right? So people are not all getting this correct, right? An economist might sit down with a spreadsheet and get somewhat closer, say, then. But uh, I think the point is that the mistakes are not made consistently in any one direction. Right, so I might know through my friend that their Corolla, they seem to put gas in their Corolla a lot less than I put gas in my uh, uh, you know, Ford Focus. Um, people, gas prices are very, very visible. Uh, gasoline is the kind of thing that when you share a ride with someone, you might actually even pay them for it, whereas nobody is going to be you know, trying to pay your electric bill when they come over and enjoy some of your air conditioning. Right? Uh, so there's, you know, gas is something that I think is uniquely so yeah, people, people pay attention to it. There's evidence they run out of it because they, so you know when gas prices go up, people run out a lot more because people are that constrained at how much they can put in every time at the pump that I think there is a, I think people have a pretty good sense of how far they can get on $20 worth of, worth of gas. That would be the argument. Uh, and and if, if they don't, they make mistakes in offsetting mistakes, right? Some people think that Corollas are really, really good when maybe they're not. So um, about your gasoline tax, that that being really effective and that people will really respond. I mean, if I think about it, you know, 33 cents per gallon, mm -hmm. which what would be equal to the social cost of carbon, you know, maybe in the first month or two or six months, people would react. But after that, they kind of forget what the price of gas used to be. Used to be. Mm. Uh, 
and, and I think you did a lot of calculations with like a dollar a gallon, which would be what the equivalent of $100 per ton mm -hmm. tax or more, which is really, really a high carbon tax. Um, so, I mean, do you, do you really think that, that these will be durable, that it's not going to be sort of a one-time shock that will get people to behave better, but, but, you know, next year or the year after, they'll just go buy a car because they forgot the price has got a big tax in it? So there's, um, if you look at what happened to SUV sales when gasoline prices went up, people don't forget that gas is $4 a gallon or three fifty. I would argue. That, that it's, um, people might forget, a, so there's some evidence that if you do these, these advertising based or sort of uh, psychological efforts to make people buy something more efficient or turn the thermostat down or something, maybe they go back to their old habits. Uh, but with gasoline, uh, a lot of the changes people make are, are actually hard to reverse, right? So if gas is more expensive and you move closer to where you work, yeah, you're not going to forget that gas is expensive and move far away. Right? Structural changes, but if uh -huh. you still live as far, but you still drive on weekends or something. It seems like gas prices go up and down all the time, and there's not. So if you, if you sort of look at the, the people who estimate what's, what's called this elasticity, look at very long cycle changes and gas prices going up and down, and it seems very persistent. The other, the other evidence I would offer is cross-sectional. So if you look from city to city where taxes are slightly different and the price of gas is slightly different or state to state, those changes seem very persistent. It's, it's not that in California we've sort of forgotten that gas is expensive here and, and, and gone back to some other, some other approach, right? These changes are slow enough that people seem to internalize them. The other thing I'd say in your defense, Mark, is the budget constraint also helps too, in the That's sense right. that if the price <laughs> you is actually higher, notice the money. You, you got yeah. less money. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, can you uh, address uh, uh, how electric vehicles fit into this since they don't have gas taxes and what mm -hmm. sort of research is being done on that? There's some, I'm glad you asked. There's some very, very interesting stuff on. on um, electric vehicles. They, in the fuel economy standards, they're given quite high ratings, usually around 100 miles a gallon, 150 miles a gallon. So they, they help a car company a lot to sell one. Uh, there's some, the, the key point, I suppose, is where the electricity comes from. Right? So there's some interesting studies now pointing out that in the Midwest, you're mostly burning coal in your car, and you're actually probably putting up more CO2 than you would with gasoline. Uh, in California, of course, our electricity is, is more natural gas based uh, and, and renewable, and so you're actually it's very comparable to a, a Prius, say, uh, to buy an electric uh, car in terms of CO2. Uh, so, so I think that at the moment, they're probably somewhat overcredited in CAFE in the sense that, that more CO2 is going up than, than we, we think, or than, than they're, is being counted. But uh, that if we make the grid, the electric grid, clean in short order, that that would actually be justified maybe even in then some, right? If we can get the electric grid completely clean, then these cars are actually almost zero CO2. It's, it depends on the electricity infrastructure. Is the extent to which, um, yeah, you know, what sort of is going to replace gas taxes? Suppose we all went uh, electric, that. right? Uh, yeah. That's a whole can of worms, but maybe you No, that's right. No, no, I was just complaining that I have a, a, a friend in San Diego who just put solar on his roof and stopped paying an electric bill and just bought an electric car and stopped paying gas taxes. And I said, well, who's going to pay for the highway? And who's going to pay for all the transformers and the reliability infrastructure? Right? So this is a, this is a point that people are starting to, uh, starting to think about. Right? So the, the solution is presumably an annual registration tax or mileage taxes uh, to the extent that's, that's measurable. Yes? Um, in Europe, the price of fuel is twice, maybe sometimes three times what it is here in the cars. <coughs> Passenger cars tend to be smaller and, uh, in my experience, highly efficient. Mm -hmm. um, have you done any modeling of that vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. situation? Yeah, so it's, it's mm -hmm. difficult to draw these sorts of cross-sectional comparisons when the argument could be, well, the rail infrastructure is so much different or the parking spaces are so much right? So it's, it, it's an interesting place to look, but one that's very challenging to look in terms of making a statement that you can be sure isn't going to get picked apart by someone who says, well, you know, in Italy, small cars are fashionable. So they drive small cars because of fashion, not because of the high price of gas. Right? So it's, unless you have a place where the gas price changes or, or you're pretty sure that everything else is similar, it's hard to draw those cross-country comparisons. But I don't think anyone would doubt that one of the reasons why people have smaller cars and fewer cars and, and live in 
condensed sort of uh, villages next to train stations and things is because gas costs nine ten dollars a gallon. I, 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 I agree with you, but it's very hard to measure that effect uh, when so many other things are different. Question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about it, if you have any data on um, the effect of CAFE versus um, gas taxes in low-income communities mm -hmm. um, where resource equity is already a challenge. Yes, uh, so, so there's no question that uh, in the U.S. a gasoline tax has regressive incidence uh, in the sense that the people paying more of it as a fraction of their income are uh, in sort of the lower third. Uh, some work with Larry Golder actually a number of years ago on, on this very, very topic. The very poorest people tend not to have cars and live in cities, so they actually are, are unaffected, but they're sort of this lower middle uh, that bears most of the incidence. Now, it turns out that a gas tax raises so much revenue that if you give that back flat, so if you give a, a sort of the same check or the same amount back to, to everyone, they start to look very progressive. Um, but if you, if you give the money back, say, against an income tax or something, then you have to deal with the regressive, regressive incidence. So I would say that the answer is yes, there's a regressive incidence, but they, they raise so much revenue that it's actually very easy to fix that regressivity if you, if you distribute the revenue back in a progressive fashion, you can, it's, it's very easy to neutralize. And, and of course, in developing economies, the interesting thing is that the, these are very progressive taxes, right? So because uh, it's only the upper class that owns, owns cars. Way, way in the back. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I really appreciate the point that a gas tax offers the marketplace many options, whereas the cafe standards force uh, these changes through technology. But do you think that that kind of technological forcing and the investment that, that you see because of it might lead to breakthrough changes in technology such as electric cars? It might. And, and, and there, one can also argue that there could be spillovers to, to other sorts of uh, energy efficiency, other devices. Um, uh, so there, there, a case can be made for subsidizing technology or encouraging technology that we think might otherwise not appear. Um, Generally, I think the case is stronger for investment in things like basic research and basic R&D than, than it is to actually subsidize the, the final end product, you know, the, the commodity using this, uh, using this technology. But there is, yes, there is a case to be made for technology. If you think you can get that breakthrough with, with CAFE, then certainly it's, yeah. Jim. Yeah, I'd like to return to the issue of the weight-based standards versus the old CAFE standards. Uh, and uh, as, as one of the three people on the National Academy study that recommended that we move in this direction, uh -huh. I have a personal bias okay. right here. Um, let, me, let me give some argument, some discussion, and see if you've ta have you taken each one of those, these into account. First, the existing CAFE standards, the old CAFE standards, had a very large incentive for buying trucks versus cars because there was a very significant difference. And that was a, when, when we, were, we were recommending change to attribute base, we wanted to get rid of that big difference. So, Unfortunately, you didn't. Well, no, no, <laughs> yes. let's, 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 let's yes. talk about it still. Um, instead of a, a step function, there, yeah. we wanted a, a, a continuum yeah. uh, rather than a step function. Because we wanted to eliminate both what was a very strong um, incentive, which empirically trucks, was yeah, towards, yeah. towards having SUVs mm -hmm. and trucks, and also an incentive for taking what would normally be a car and, and define it as a truck. Uh, the PT Cruiser should... <laughs> that's correct. That's yeah, a, yeah. That that was a truck was, was, was not, <laughs> was not an accident. Right. Yes. Okay, so, so then... So, Okay, so that's the first issue. The second issue was there was a whole group of manufacturers that were above the standards. Mm -hmm. And with the way that they exist on a vehicle-by-vehicle uh, -vehicle basis, there was no incentive on them to reduce their standards mm -hmm. at all. A weight-based standard, you can sort of think about making it more fit. You right. can do yeah. more gasoline for the heavy, but it also means less gasoline can be used by even the lighter vehicles. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is really trading off that more incentive now for the lighter vehicle for less incentives on the bigger vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is the way I believe it was ultimately designed, but I'm not 100% sure about this last point, is that 
we recognize to make a car bigger, bigger footprint, it actually costs more. Mm -hmm. So if you have the benefits for the CAFE standard being less, for, less than the cost of making the car bigger, you don't then have a marginal incentive for bigger cars. You, you're, you're roughly, you can remain roughly neutral. Now, I thought that was the way it was ultimately defined, so how, given those three things, have you concluded that, in fact, this new system is, is less effective than the distorted old system that we had? Yeah. So, long question. So yes, thank you. No, thank you for this. This is very interesting. So first of all, uh, there's no question that getting rid of the car and light truck distinction would be beneficial. Uh, and it's, it's possible that that could be even more beneficial than the added costs of footprint basis. Sadly, of course, there's two different footprint schedules, right? One for yeah. light trucks and one for cars, and the one for light, they, they kept this By distinction. Way, we didn't recommend I'm, I'm sure you didn't recommend that. No, and in fact, I, I know some folks at EPA will tell you off the record that they're really sad that that actually is still there, right? So, 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 um, so there's, but I agree. Uh, certainly getting rid of that distinction was good. Um, with respect to different manufacturers, this is a very important point. Um, and, and, and one that's solvable with trading, which incidentally is also part of the new footprint standard. So you could have the most efficient would be to have a single standard with trading. Uh, a footprint standard reduces the amount of trading you need. But since you also added trading at the same time, there's no added benefit from the, the footprint, right? That the, the trading means that you're gonna get the same incentive on all cars, regardless of whether that line is sloped or, or flat. Uh, on the last point on marginal incentives, uh, there's, I, I would recommend uh, a paper by Kuichiro Ito and Jim Sali that's, that's uh, very new that looks at this. And they argue that no matter how smooth you make that function or how close to flat it is, so you're arguing sort of if it's close enough to flat that the, the slope won't be enough to want to, that they, they show that there is always an incentive to distort. That if, if there's a slope, there's an incentive to distort. Now, it might not be very large if the slope is close to flat, but any, and the steeper is the slope, the bigger the incentive to distort. Now, imagine, um, so take extended cab versus regular cab pickups, right? So the extended cab pickups are more expensive to manufacture. They also get somewhat worse fuel economy. Uh, but maybe it used to be that manufacturers were charging a little more for those because they knew they couldn't sell too many because it would blow the, their average, right? So they were implicitly taxing them a little bit. And as a result of this slope, they don't have to tax them as much. Now you're saying that maybe they still have to tax them, right? You didn't make the slope so steep that, that, they, that they're gonna untax them altogether. They're still gonna tax them a little bit, but they're not taxing them as much. And so then there will be more of them, right? So there's this, this sense that there's always a margin. Um, but again, I, I haven't worked on this directly, but this Celine Edo paper is very, very nice. And I, I, I think very convincing that there's, there's always a marginal incentive if you give some vehicle a, a more generous uh, cafe allocation than another, there's always at least some incentive on the margin. Uh, yeah, but you, you've got to be, well, I'll take this offline with one, but you've got to balance against the marginal externality that you get between those. Be, and and uh, so, the, so that there, I, I think that if you look back at the earlier papers, it, it shows that it, there is an incentive, but there's an optimal slope if you think that there is only a finite uh, damage for having more gasoline, if, if, if there's not an absolute that you want to get, but there's a, only a finite damage for it. So you, you want would, the incentive mm. to be related to the marginal damages. But this is getting a little too technical, so I'm going to back <laughs> off right now. All right, we should take it offline. But I, yeah. I, I think that as long as there's trading, so there's always been trading within a manufacturer, right? If one of my cars is over, another one can be under and, and vice versa. And particularly if there's also trading across manufacturers, to, to me it seems like I want the same incentive on all cars because the gallon of gas does the same amount of damage no matter which car burned it. Uh, and and you, you only get that with a flat standard. But I, I, we, can, we can take this offline. <laughs> okay, well, we don't want to keep people past the due date, but thanks very much, Matt. Uh,